Chapter 11 Boy in the taking of Bruchek's children. Trench Repairs, Parts 1, 2, and 3 Questions as to the whys and the wherefores of survival. A reprisal of the tale of his father's. His name was Boy. Granted, his ma had given him another name, but she had been dead for more than three-something years now, and he had been so young he had no longer remembered what it was that she had called him. Instead, he had taken the name of the oxies used for him when they tried to catch him to take him to the machine men and make the big making places. Come here, boy, they would say. We don't want to hurt you, boy. The voices, breathless from running, their stupid faces red and panting, trying to chase him as he danced away from them across the rubble. Some of them, the clever ones, he guessed, would even try to trick him. We have food, boy, they'd say. Come down here. We will share some with you. But they could never fool him. He was boy, and he lived wild and swift and free in the ruins of the city. Try as they might, the Oxys and the machine men would never get him. Now the cloak he had made from rat skins and scavenged sacking cloth wrapped tight about him to keep out the cold. Boy crouched, hidden in a hollow in the rubble, waiting to see if one of the children of the Captain Rat would take his bait. The pickings had been good this week, with Captain Rat sending at least one of his children along each day for Boy to kill and eat. In return, Boy had done right by the Cap'n, just like he promised him, forsaking all the other gods and praying to Captain Rat over each of his kills. As far as his agreements went, Boy reckoned it had been a pretty good one. Only problem was, despite the fact he had been waiting in the same place for hours now, so far today, the captain didn't seem in any great hurry to live up to his end of the bargain. Then, at last, Boy saw signs of progress, tempted from his burrow by the promise of easy pickings. A rat emerged from the nearby hole in the rubble and moved quickly across the rocks towards the bait until coming to a small piece of greasy flesh Boy had set out as a lure. The rat paused with whiskers twitching wearily, as though some inner instinct had alerted it to danger. Too late to be twitching your whiskers now, brother rat, Boy thought, a feral smile playing across his cracked lips as he aimed his slingshot and loosed the taut string to let fly with a two-inch metal nail. Should not I have got so greedy, coming on the open in the sun time like that? Flying fast and true, the nail took the rat square in the back of the neck, stabbing through its spine into the skull. On his feet, and moving before the nail had even hit its target, Boyd jumped from cover to race, scampering across the rubble to retrieve his prize. Grabbing the dead rat by the tail, he turned and ran back to find refuge again in his hiding place. Then, pulling the nail free and daubing two smears of the rat's blood across his cheeks, he knelt to send a silent prayer of, of thanksgiving to his unseen benefactor. Praise him, Captain Rat, he thought as he looked down at the body of his catch and considered its worth. Praise him for making so many of your children. Praise him for making them big and fat. And praise him for sending them to me so I don't starve. It was a good rat, fine and sleek, with the kind of big and meaty haunches he knew would make for tasty eatings. Nor did the value of the rat to boy in there. He could make clothing from its pelt, sewing thread from its sinews, needles and trap hooks from its bones and teeth and claws. No part of the rat's body would go wasted. 
by virtue of the survival skills he had learned first by watching his mother, and then on his own after her death. Boy could find use for anything. Abruptly, he found himself thinking of how things used to be when Ma was still alive. He remembered the cellar where they used to live, her kind and careworn face, the soft lullabies she would sing to drift him off to sleep. He remembered sitting on her knee as she told him the reasons they stay in hiding. They say we must give up our children, she had told them. The generals, they say children are a distraction in wartime, that the people of Buryotruk must all serve in the auxiliaries while their children are cared for in the orphanums. But I don't believe them. I think they want to give the children over to the Adeptus Mechanicus, the machine men, so they can train them to be workers in the Manifactorums, the big dangerous making places. But I won't let them do it, my baby boy. I won't let them take you, no matter what happens. You can always know your ma will keep you safe. His heart growing heavy, Boy remembered other things as well. He remembered the sound of thunder rolling across the ground above their heads one night, while they crouched, huddled in the cellar. He remembered the cave-in and his mother's body laying crushed among the rubble. He remembered her eyes staring at him, cold and dead from the face covered in thick layer of dust. He remembered crying for hours, scared and lonely. Not understanding how it was, she could have left him. And his own eyes stinging wetly at the corners. Boy found he didn't want to have anything more to do with remembering for a while. Sucking a breath of air and rubbing the back of his head across his face. The back of his hand across his face to clear his eyes. Boy decided it was time to head back to his warren and get to eating Brother Rat. Too smart to just head there directly in case anyone was looking. He took the long way, cutting a twisted path through the maze of shattered buildings and mounds of rubble all around him. Then as he crossed near the summit of one of the mounds, he noticed something that gave him pause. A smell, almost. Something gathering on the wind, for a moment, feeling a sudden chill at the base of his spine, Boy stood looking out toward the east. Before him, the city seemed quiet, its deserted streets appearing every bit as dead and lifeless as the ruined, burnt-out buildings that surrounded them on every turn. Boy was not fooled. After three-something years living alone among the rubble now, he had developed a sixth sense when it came to the city in its ways. A sense that, right here and now, told him he had best be weary. I'd be getting myself back underground and staying there a while, he thought as he finally turned to make for home. There's trouble brewing. The wind says it's clear and loud. A bad day's coming, and like as not lots of people's gonna die. What was life like where you were born? Lon asked Bolivin, lifting another shovelful of earth into the blade of his entrenching tool, as the big man stood beside him. On your homeworld, I mean. On Verdun, Bolden said, pausing in his work long enough to wipe the sweat from his chapped brow before it could freeze. It was good enough, I suppose. Certainly there were a lot of worse planets a man could be form. They were standing in the trench with shovels in their hands. Deva and Scala beside them while Zebo stood on the firing step on watch, trying to repair the damage done to the trench in the course of the shelling. Returning to their trench in the aftermath of the bombardment, the fire team had arrived to find the explosion of a nearby shell had caused part of the trench's rear wall to collapse half burying the trench interior in clods of frozen earth. Now, 
After half an hour of back-breaking labor, the trench floor was mostly cleared. The excess earth having been piled out of the way into another corner of the trench. Personally, I say you are doing our home world a grave disservice, Bolvin, Deva said, sitting on the end of his shovel. That sounds uncomfortable. And watching them as they moved the last of the fallen earth. Frankly, my own recollection suggests Verdun was every bit as much of a stinking hellhole as Birchek. Granted, we didn't have all these orcs to contend with there. I'm sure I don't remember having to do so much digging back home, though. I don't seem to have noticed you doing so much digging here, either, Bolvin said. Most of the time, in fact, you have been standing there and leaving all the work to the others. Pfft. It was simply a matter of maintaining a proper division of labor, Davis said. Each man performs a task to which he is best suited, which in this case means that you, scholar, and the new fish do the donkey work while I oversee you laborers in a, in a supervisory capacity. Besides, someone must watch to make sure the new fish can tell one end of a spade from the other. Not to mention your visual role in keeping us all warm, Lon said, so annoyed now at the ugly dwarf's constant insults that he found himself responding in kind without even thinking. And Bruno knows if it wasn't for all your hot air spewing about this trench, we might have frozen to death long ago. For a moment, shocked at his response, the others looked at him in silence. Then abruptly, Scalder and Bovin broke into surprised laughter. Even Davis' face briefly crackled into a begrudging smile. Only Zebas seemed unmoved, scowling down at Lan from the firing step with the same hostile expression he always wore. Ha! <laughs> Hot air! Bolvin said, laughing. That's a good one. The new fish may not have been here very long, Deva, but you have to admit, he got your number fast enough. Yah, yah, yah. Keep on laughing, pig brain. Davis said, his gruff demeanor abruptly restored as he turned to look at Lon in a tight-lipped derision. So it seems a little puppy has claws. Very good, new fish. Well done. You made a joke. Ha! Ha! You are very funny. But don't let your head get too big now. The orcs like nothing better than to see the new fish with a big head. It gives them more of a target to aim at. The repairs continued, having finally cleared the trench of earth. They laid down their shovels. Then, as Lan watched them, Bolvin and Scholar picked up an oblong sheet of metal laying across the trench floor and pressed it against the ragged hole in the trench wall. Holding upright, as David took a wooden prop and used his shovel to hammer the prop in place to keep the sheet in position. There, Davis said, checking the hole was fully covered and putting his weight against the prop to make sure it was tight. That should hold long enough for us to finish the repairs. What now? Non asked. We have cleared the floor. How do we repair the hole itself? How? Davis said. Well, first thing, you pick up your shovel again, new fish. You see that pile of earth over there? he said, pointing towards the clods of frozen earth they had already moved over the corner of the trench. The pile you just moved. Well, now, you take your shovel, pick it up, move with it over there, then use it to fill in the original hole. I know, I know. You needn't say it. With all this endless excitement... Who can believe that anyone ever told you that life in the guard might be boring? I don't understand how this is supposed to work, Lon said later, his hands blistered through his gloves and his back aching from using the shovel as they refilled the hole in the trench wall with soil. Even after we've filled all the hole in... <clears throat> When did the wall just collapse again the moment we take the prop away? 
We don't take the proper way in the fish, Bolvin said, shoveling beside him. Not at first, anyway. First we fill the hole, next we wet the soil, then we tap it all down and leave it to freeze for a while. Then after a couple of hours, we finally remove the prop, and the wall will be as good as new. Trust me, new fish. It always works. You wouldn't believe how many times we've had to repair this trench since we first dug it. Wet it, Lon asked. Don't we need a bucket, then, to fetch more water? We haven't got much left in our canteens. Bucket? Canteens? What? Bolvin said, pausing in his labors to look at Lon with raised eyebrows. We're repairing a trench wall, new fish. We don't use drinking water for that. But then what do we use? Lon asked, beginning to feel foolish as he realized the others were smirking at him. What do we use, he says, Davo said, rolling his eyes towards the heavens. My broad verdant backside, I swear, new fish, just when I was starting to think you might be a total idiot, you say something stupid and ruin my good opinion of you. If it helps you to answer your own question, here are a couple of hints. 1. It's always better to use something warm when repairing trench walls in frozen conditions. 2. Every human being carries a ready supply of the stuff in question about the person. Warm? Lon said, a new understanding slowly dawning on him. You mean we... Ah, finally, he understands, Davis said. Yes, that is right, new fish. And guess what? It's your turn first. Now get on up there and start pissing, boy. I only hope to hell you hadn't gotten a nervous bladder. And for a nose, I have better things to do with my time than standing around here waiting for you to piss. What about your own world, then, new fish? Bolvin asked afterwards, as they sat in the trench waiting for the newly repaired wall to freeze. You asked me about Verdun before. What was your home world like? Trying to think of an answer. For a moment, Lon was quiet. He thought about his parents. The farm. The endless golden wheat fields swaying in the breeze. He thought of his family. All of them sitting at their places around the table in the kitchen as they made ready for the evening meal. He thought of that last beautiful sunset. The sky reddening as the fiery orb of the descending sun fell slowly towards the horizon. He thought of the world he had left behind. And of all the things he would never see again. It all seemed so long ago. And far away now, he thought, as though all those things were a million kilometers away from me. The sad thing is, they are even further away than that. Not just a million, but millions and millions of kilometers. However far it was, we came in that troop ship. I don't know, he said at last unable to find the words to say that he really felt. It was different anyway. A lot different from this place. Hmm. I think our new fish is starting to feel homesick, Davo said. Not that I blame him. You understand? Any place would seem rosy when compared to this damn stinkhole. You find me in a strangely magnus mood, however. So let me give you a piece of advice. Whatever wistful longings you may harbor for the world of your birth, forget them. This is Birorok. There is no room for sediment here. Here, yeah. a man must keep himself hard and tight if we want to live to see tomorrow. Is that it, then? Lon asked. I remember Scholar told me you were all that had survived from over six thousand men. Is that how you did it, by 
keeping yourselves hard and tight. Ah, there, there you are. You have touched upon an interesting question, new fish, Scholar said. How was it we survived when so many of our fellows didn't? Hmm? You can be sure it was a regular topic of conversation hereabouts. Each man has its own opinions. Some say that to have managed to live so long in Birorocca at all, we must have been born survivors to begin with. Others say it must have been a combination of fate and good judgment, or perhaps only a matter of poor dumb luck. As I say, everyone has their own opinions, their own theories. For myself, I am not sure I put much store in my in any of them, honestly. We survived where others died. This is all I can tell you. I always thought the Emperor must have had a hand in it, Bolvin said. His expression was quiet and thoughtful. That perhaps he was saving us for some greater purpose. At least, that is what I used to believe. After so many years in Birorok, a man begins to wonder. The Emperor? Davis said, throwing his hands up in a gesture of frustration. Really, this time you really have excelled yourself. Of all the lupin-headed stupidities I have heard pouring from your mouth over the last seventeen years since we were inducted into the guard, that is without a doubt of my mind the most idiotic thing I have ever heard you say. The Emperor! Pah! You think the Emperor has nothing better to do than watch over your fat backside to make sure it comes to no harm? Wake up, you pig pile of horse manure! The Emperor doesn't even know you, me, or any one of us exist. And if he does know, then he doesn't care. No! Lon shouted. The sudden loudness of his voice in the trench startled them. You are wrong! You don't know what you're talking about. Then seeing the others looking at him in bewilderment, Lan began to speak again, more quietly now. The words spilling heartfelt from his mouth. I'm sorry, he said. I didn't mean to yell. But I heard what you were saying, and you were wrong, Deva. The Emperor does care. He watches over all of us. I know he does. And I could prove it. If the Emperor wasn't good and kind and just, he never would have saved my great-grandfather's life. And then, as about him, the others sat quietly in the trench and listened. Lon told them the same tale his father had told him in the farmhouse cellar on his last night at home. He told them about his great-grandfather, about his name was Augustus, and he had been born on a world called Arcadius V. He told them about him being called into the guard, and how he sad he had felt at leaving his home world. He told them about the thirty years of service and his great-grandfather's failing health. He told them about the lottery and the man who had given up his ticket. He told them it was a miracle, a quiet miracle, perhaps, but a miracle all the same. Then... When he had told them all these things, word for word the same as his father had told him, Lon fell quiet and waited to hear the reaction. Is that it? Davos said, the first to speak after what felt to Lon like an age of silence. Is that the proof you talked about? This tale your father told you? It is an interesting story, new fish, Scholar said. His expression ill at ease. Ha! Story is right, Zebus said, looking sarcastically down at Lan from the top of the firing step. A fairy story like parents tell their children to make them sleep. And you believe that crap? No fish. <laughs> Maybe you should go tell your story to the orcs and see if a miracle saves you then. Shut up, Zebus! Bolvin snapped. You're supposed to be on watch, not flapping your lips about. It's not as though anyone asked for your opinion. Leave the new fish alone. Then, Sia crowd Zebas to silence. 
Bovin turned towards Lond again. Scholar is right, Newfish. It was an interesting story. You told it well. Is that all you were going to say? Lon asked, surprised. You all sound like you think something is wrong. As though you don't believe what I told you. We don't believe it, new fish. David was blunt. Granted, Skull and Bolvin are trying to be shooting about it, but they don't believe it either. None of us do, frankly. And the story you just told us is what passes your benchmark for a miracle. You're even more of an innocent than you look. I would have expected you to say that, Deva. Lon said. You don't believe in anything. But what about the rest of you? Scholar. Bolvin. Surely you could see that what happened to my great-grandfather was a miracle. It was proof that the Emperor watches out for us. It's not a matter of believing you. Scholar said, lifting his shoulders in a helpless shrug. It's just that, even if we accept the details of your story that, and believe that they are true, new fish, those same details are open to a variety of interpretations. Interpretations? Lon said. What are you talking about? He's saying you are being naive, new fish, Davis said. Oh, he's doing it in that scholarly way of ease, of course. Just tiptoeing around the subject rather than coming right out and saying what is on his mind directly. But he thinks you are naive. We all do. You'll have to understand our experience of life makes us see things differently, Scholar said. But how is there any different way to see it? Lon said. You heard the story. What about the man giving my great-grandfather his ticket? Surely you can see that that must have been the hand of the Emperor at work. Far be it for me to shatter your illusions, new fish, Davis said. But I doubt the hand of the Emperor had anything to do with it. <laughs> no, likely the only hands involved in it at all would have belonged to your great-grandfather. Uh what do you mean? He killed him, new fish, Davis said. The man with the ticket? Your great-grandfather killed him and took his ticket from him. That's your miracle. N no No, Lon said, looking quietly from face to face in disbelief. You are wrong. Of course, I can see how it could have happened, Davis said. There's your great-grandfather. He's sick, ailing. He knows winning the lottery is his only chance of making it out to the god alive. Then when someone else gets the winning ticket, he realizes that only one man's life stands between him and freedom. And he was a soldier. He'd killed before. What is one more life in the grand scale of things, he tells himself. It's a doggy -e dog universe, new fish, and it sounds like your great-grandfather was a dirtier dog than most. N no! Lon said. You're not listening to me. I'm telling you, you are wrong about this. You are sick, Deva. How could you even think something like that? It's in the name, new fish, Scholar said sadly. Or the lack of one, I mean. Yeah, the name... Davis said. That's what clenches it. What are you... I, I, I don't understand. What they're talking about. The name of the man who gave your great-grandfather the ticket, new fish. Bolvin said with a sigh. It wasn't part of the story. And you must be able to see that makes all the difference. I'm sorry to tell you this, but that is what proves your great-grandfather killed him. Uh, the name? Lon was floundering now, his stomach churning, his head dizzying as though the world about him had suddenly begun to turn strangely on its axis. Think about any fish, Davis said. 
This man is supposed to have saved your great-grandfather's life. Your great-grandfather must have known his name. He was a comrade of his, remember? A man who had fought side by side with him through thirty years of the guard. And yet years later, when your great-grandfather tells the tale of to his son, he somehow neglects to even mention the name of the man who saved his life. It just doesn't add up, you know? Especially considering you told us your great-grandfather was a pious man. A man that, like, if somebody does them a good turn, they remember them in their prayers to the Emperor for the rest of their life. It does have a ring of guilty conscience about it, Nefish. Scholar said. Though if it isn't any cons consolation to you, it also suggests your great-grandfather was not given easily to murder. If he had been more cold-blooded man, presumably, he'd have just told his son the man's name and thought no more about it. Not really, Scholar, Davis said. Even though years had passed by then, he could have still been worried about his crime being found out. Maybe he thought it was better to let bad dogs lie and never mention the name ever. Either way, it doesn't really make any difference. Your great-grandfather killed the man, they fish, stole his ticket. That's all there is to it. So much for miracles. N no, you've got it wrong, Lon said. There must be another explanation. One you haven't thought of. Surely you, you could see that my great-grandfather wouldn't have done anything like that. But as Lon looked at them, it was clear to him that was exactly what they did believe. Deva, Scholar, Bolden, Zebas, all of them. Looking at the faces of each man of the trench, Lon could see their minds were made up. There had been no miracle, no example of the Emperor's grace. To them it was a simple matter. His great-grandfather killed a man and lied about it afterwards. No! No! Lon said at last, hating how weak his voice sounded and why it wavered. No! Y you were wrong! You were wrong! I don't believe you! Seems like every one of these actually gets more and more dramatic. The more I read into each one of these stories, there's more dramatic elements that I need to act out in each one of these, and... I hope I gave this one a little bit more justice than... I thought I did, because I think I did kind of poorly on it. Like, I really want to redo this whole entire audio chapter, but... It's been a good while since I posted anything. I'm sorry for doing that. It's just I've been stupidly busy in life. <sighs> it's, it's, um, five in the morning when I'm editing this, um, finishing the recording to be edited after. I am tired. I am dead. Yeah, a lot of messing up, a lot of mistakes, left and right, all over. I did read the, the chapter already, that's why I was able to do a lot of the uh, dramatic bits with barely any stutters or like the <laughs> that I normally do sometimes that no one ever hears because I normally cut it out. Like, uh, sometimes when I say some of the Patreon names, I actually fumble the words for their names and have to redo the whole entire thing in one go because sometimes it's not easy to, uh, say everyone's name really quickly and fastly like I normally do. 
I don't think fastly is a real word, but I'm keeping it in there. Speaking of the patrons, let us say thank you to the ongoing patrons support members of the channel. Let us say thank you to Mr. Cosman123, Coco Azakela Coffee, Meltdown480, Eldrick Maldred, Fortis Unam, Nicholas Gur, Lilac NPC, Starboard, Thompson235, Azuth89, Joss Sickles, and Angelo Nicholas. Thank you for all being Patreon supporters of the channel. If you want to be a Patreon supporter of the channel and join the Discord, see funny things, post uh, memes in Discord, talk with me, and just hang out in general, uh, just join the Patreon dollar a month. That's all I'm going to say. I haven't posted anything there and I think a month, so I'm sorry about that. Again, I have just been busy with work. I am going in and out of sleep. I could feel my head slowly drifting backwards as I sit in my little audio cocoon. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm going to end the video here because I think I'm going to knock out any second now. <sighs> Alright. Ugh. Sweet dreams. Thank you for watching the channel, the video. Uh, hopefully you have a great day, whatever it is that you're up to. And, um, can't wait to see you in the next one. Stay safe out there, and have yourselves a good one. Good morning, good night, good afternoon, and good luck at work. Or whatever you're doing. Bye.